Nice. Welcome to Action Packed, where we look at action movies and find out just how packed they are. Today we'll be looking at From Russia With Love, the second James Bond movie released in 1963, just one year after Dr. No. Dr. No director Terence Young would come back to direct From Russia With Love, only directing one more Bond movie before moving on to different projects. Young's first credit as a director is also Christopher Lee's film debut, Corridor of Mirrors, so that's kinda cool. From Russia With Love follows James Bond to Istanbul, Turkey, where he aids in the defection of Russian officer Tatiana Romanova. In return, the British would secure a lector, a cryptology device used to decode messages from the Russians. This is Cold War times, people, remember that. What he doesn't know is that it's all a trap by secret organization Spectre to secure the lector for their own and to kill Bond as revenge for Dr. No. With double the budget this time round, it was the first Bond movie to have its own song, From Russia With Love, sung by Matt Monroe. Link to that gem in the description. Production went over budget and time and was rushed to finish by its planned release date. Did being rushed mean they couldn't deliver on the action? Let's start the movie and find out. The movie begins with our hero James Bond sneaking through this dark courtyard, but he better watch out. I had another joke that goes here, but watch out works pretty good for this scene. Don't worry though, that's not James Bond at all. Just some guy in a sick cosplay who I get to add to the list early. And that guy that just did the killing is Irish murder machine Donald Grant, an elite assassin Spectre trained for one sole purpose, to kill James Bond. Morzeni, the guy running this Bond killing camp, comes up and tells Grant his excellent time, while also flexing those ventriloquism classes he's been taking. Exactly one minute, 52 seconds, that's excellent. Those are really paying off. I love how he walks away swinging the mask here, like, you guys ever look up at the stars and wonder what's up there? Cutting next to an intense chess match, we're introduced to chess master Kronstein, a Spectre agent also known as Number 5. Number 5 is instructed that Number 1 is called for his presence, and he's like four numbers higher than him, so we better get moving. He's playing Canadian chess master McAdams here. It's never mentioned that this guy's supposed to be Canadian, but the way he loses tells us everything. Hi, congratulations, sir. A brilliant coup. That was a pretty good coup, eh? Kronstein leaves victorious and absolutely just denies this poor guy's handshake. Jesus, I should put this guy on the list. Kronstein enters the office of Number One, the head of evil organization Spectre and owner of this cute little kitty. Number One, although never actually seen in this movie, is played by Anthony Dawson, the same guy who played R.J. Dent in Dr. No. I'm just rattling off the facts in this episode. It's episode two, bitches, let's get it. As a chess master and all-round evil bastard, Kronstein has all possible scenarios planned out for Spectre to obtain a lector decoding device and to kill James Bond all in one shot. Rosa Kleb, or Number 3, a former Russian colonel turned Spectre agent, is assigned to head the operation and make sure Grant can kill Bond at the right time. They plan to use Russian agent Tatiana Romanova to unknowingly aid in their plot. Romanova has no idea that Kleb is working for Spectre. Kleb tells Romanova that she's just doing it to give false information to the enemy. No mysterious plots here, but you know how it is, Tatiana. Do it or die. I will obey your orders. Good. When we finally catch up with the real James Bond, he's kissing up a storm with Sylvia Trench, who we last saw giving us the people's eyebrow and making James late for a trip to Jamaica. But M's calling again, and you know how that goes, Sylvia. Uh, tell him I'm away, will you? He is not on his way. Damn, Sylvia, chill. Getting to M's office, M briefs James on the situation. Romanova wants help getting to England, and he's gonna honor that so he can get a taste of her sweet, sweet lector. M tells James that Ali Karim Bey, head of the MI6 station in Istanbul, will be waiting to assist him. James isn't so sure and thinks it's all a trap. M thinks it's a trap too, but he doesn't give a shit. Britain needs that damn decoder, so James better pack his fucking bags, cause he's going to Istanbul. Before leaving, Q equips James with a special Itachi briefcase. This thing has everything. It's got extra bullets, it's got gold coins, a sniper rifle, and even some tear gas that goes off if the case is opened incorrectly. Q also had a brief appearance in Dr. No, taking Bond's Beretta and giving him his standard Walther PPK, but I didn't mention him because the part was so small. He was played by Peter Burton in Dr. No, but Burton was unavailable to return to the role, so Desmond Llewellyn stepped in to replace him. Llewellyn would play the role for 36 years and across 17 films, so we'll be seeing a lot of this guy. Arriving in Istanbul, James meets Ali Karim Bey's chauffeur, but they're followed out of the airport by a couple unnamed agents working for the Russians. And following all of them is our favorite trained psychopath, Donald Grant. James just doesn't have good luck at airports. Traveling with the chauffeur and going through a secret entrance, James meets Ali Karim Bey, who's played by Pedro Armendariz. During shooting, Pedro was diagnosed with terminal cancer and was in constant pain. He visibly limps in most of his scenes, and after finishing his parts, he went home and took his own life. 
Damn. Kareem Bay agrees that something isn't right about the situation with Romanova, but says she has her own arrangements of meeting them, so all they can really do is wait. In the meantime, James leaves for his hotel, and he's followed out again by those Russian agents. But hey, wait, the driver left his buddy behind. Oh, that's not his buddy at all, it's Donald Grant, who's tied up the other Russian and stole their car. But James can hang loose for a while, because Grant's on a side quest, dropping the car off at the Russian consulate, leaving the agent dead in the back seat. He gets into a cab with number three who says the Russians will blame the British, putting MI6 in a really awkward situation, which Spectre's all about. Good job, Grant. Bond now at his hotel cases the place and finds a wire set up by the Russians. James doesn't play that dumb shit and calls to change rooms. I don't know if he'd want to do that, James. All they have is the bridal suite. Well, let's have a look at it. I may like it. Fair enough. Meanwhile, Kareem Bay's hard at work ignoring his girlfriend's advances when his room fucking explodes. I'll put this as an explosion because it was an assassination attempt on a main character, and that's pretty ballsy, man. Rejoining Kareem Bay after the explosion, the two head to a secret waterway underground, which leads to some spying goggles. Let's take a peek at those Russians in their fancy consulate. Here we're introduced to Krolinko, who, thinking British Secret Service killed that agent from before, wants revenge on MI6, so he's the one who tried to blow Kareem Bay up. Kareem Bay says he needs time to deal with that stanky Krolinko, and that maybe because they're trying to be killed and stuff, James shouldn't go back to the hotel tonight. He's got a better idea. So they head off to spend the night at a Romani camp, but the Russians are laying in wait, and as soon as James and Kareem Bay arrive, an ambush is set in motion. This is totally out of nowhere, but this voice dub of Vavra, the leader of the camp, is just absolutely amazing. Tell our host, his hospitality overwhelms me. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Anyways, Krolenko and the boys crash the party, and that means I got a lot of frame by frame to do. Krolenko throws a knife and kills one guy outside the camp before kicking in the door with his truck. We got one guy getting shot and falling off the outlook here, and then this guy who does the I got shot dance, and also this guy who charges at Kareem Bay. Krolenko's able to hit Kareem Bay in the arm, but that doesn't stop Kareem Bay from picking up his gun and saving Bond's ass. I won't count these guys in front of the burning carriage and this guy here on the ground, because I'm not sure if they're dead, and this guy's moving his head, so I'm betting not. This other guy running at Bond, though, definitely dead, squirming on the ground like he needs an exorcist. Vavra gets a guy here, and Bond tallies another one as he saves the Romani leader's butt. Thank you, thank you. And then it's Bond's turn to be saved again, with the sneaky Grant killing a guy about to stab James in the back. Only Grant's allowed to kill James, you silly goose. I count four other guys on the ground in this wide shot, four other guys in this wide shot as well. With the invasion not going so well, Krolinko calls for retreat, and we get one more dead motherfucker for the count on their way out. Now totally sick of his hijinks, Kareem Bay and James head right to Krolenko's hideout to give him a personal thank you for almost killing them. Waiting for Krolenko to leave his hideout, Kareem Bay uses that briefcase rifle and puts the son of a bitch down, finally dealing with that stanky Krolenko. Now back at his hotel, James is hoping for some R&R, &R, but he doesn't know that's about to turn into S&M as Tatiana sneaks into his bed naked. This scene's a little weird, because they just met, uh, for the first time, you know? But I guess they didn't have Tinder in the 60s, so what are you gonna do? James wants to know a little about the lector and says he needs some floor plans to that Russian consulate building. Tatiana says he'll have his answers in the morning, but she's on a different mission right now. And little do either of them know that this is actually a threesome, because Spectre's getting freaky too. The next morning, Romanova travels to a mosque to leave James those building plans, but that pesky Russian agent is still hot on the trail. Romanova drops the plans off for James to pick up, but the Russian agent beats him to it. Before the agent has a chance to see too much, he's killed by a lurking Donald Grant. Man, Grant saved the mission more times than James. James has. Good job, Grant. James goes to pick up the package and sees the dead Russian, which means he's got to get out of there fast and go see Ali Kareem Bay. Kareem Bay and James confirm that the plans they've been given are correct, but Kareem Bay still isn't so sure that this isn't a plot by the Russians to catch them off guard. James meets Romanova on a boat so she can describe the lector on a recording for a tape he's got to send to M. But Romanova gets a little sidetracked while explaining how it works. Dushka, tell me the truth. Am I as exciting as all those Western girls? Oh, once when I was with Am in Tokyo, we had an interesting experience. Thank you, Miss Moneypenny, that's all, that's all. M thinks the lector sounds legit, so he tells James to complete the deal. Heading to the consulate, James asks if the clock is correct, but he doesn't know Russian clocks are always correct. Russian clocks are always correct. This gives us our second explosion as Kareem Bay detonates some tear gas from underneath the consulate so they can sneak away with the lector. James and Romanova pack up the lector and take an escape path underground where Kareem Bay is waiting with these cute little ratty boys. Aw, oh, look at these motherfuckers. Succeeding in the first part of their getaway, all three run to catch the Orient Express, a train they're going to use to get James and Romanova to safety. The Orient Express was a real passenger train created in 1883, and although the original was just a simple travel train, the Orient Express became synonymous with luxury travel. The original Orient operated 
updated all the way until 2009. Although there still is a novelty line that operates in Europe under the same name, using train cars from the 1920s and 30s. Jumping on board, James and Romanova are seen by a Russian agent named Benz, who we saw earlier in the consulate when Kareem Bay and James were doing some spy bonding. Pun intended. And of course, that Irish son of a bitch, Donald Grant, has also found his way onto the train. Kareem Bay brings James and Romanova to their cab and says he's gonna go confirm his plan with the conductor. Basically, Kareem Bay's sons are waiting to pick them up, and with the help of the conductor, they should be able to sneak off the train, allowing Romanova and Bond to catch a flight that should take them back to London. But this is all going too smoothly, and Kareem Bay notices Ben's getting a little too close for comfort. James says Ben's couldn't have known about the consulate before getting on the train, but Kareem Bay says he's gonna keep him company just in case, holding Ben's up in his room until they get to where they're going. But as James leaves, even more goes wrong as murder machine Donald Grant is close by and slips in to introduce himself to Ben's and Kareem Bay, killing them both and staging it to look like they killed each other. I appreciate how these stories have no qualms about killing major characters like this, but I find this one kind of lame. It was all off screen, and I think Ali Kareem Bay deserved to go out with like a fight scene or something. James pays the conductor to keep the deaths quiet, and going back to Romanova, he demands answers, thinking she had something to do with it. I don't know what you mean. Liar. <laughs> Damn, James, chill. Reaching Belgrade, James steps off to have a smoke. I'm gonna take a minute to appreciate the filmmaking here, cause this scene where Grant trails James from the train windows with the stings in the score is one of my favorite parts of the movie. It really drives home just how methodical and trained Grant is to kill Bond. Kareem Bay's other son is waiting for James and asks him why the train didn't stop at the meeting point as planned. James breaks the news that his daddy did, and James asks him to get a hold of M to send someone to meet him in Zagreb for help. But good old Donald Grant is listening in on the entire thing, and he meets up with Nat the agent sent for Bond first by impersonating Bond, and he gives us another lame off-screen kill. Now impersonating Nash, Grant meets with Bond. After exchanging formalities, all three go to dinner to discuss their escape plan, but James notices Grant drugged Tatiana's drink. When James confronts Grant about the drugs, Grant is able to persuade him into thinking it's an escape plan tailored for only him and Romanova can't come. If James would just let him explain, it would all make sense. Man, never kneel down beside the guy you thought was just doing shady shit, James. It's amateur hour out here. Overpower Bond, Grant reveals that Romanova has no idea what's going on and that he works for Spectre. James claps back, criticizing his wine choice at dinner. Red wine with fish. Well, that should have told me something. You may know the right wines. The other one on your knees. Oh shit, Grant's been trained on how to kill Bond in conversation too? This is getting serious. Grant says he's gonna kill them both and leave behind that sex film recorded by Spectre earlier. And a suicide note with Bond, with the note stating that Romanova was gonna release the film to the press unless he married her. Tricking Grant into opening up Nash's briefcase, the case explodes with tear gas just as Q promised it would. Thanks Q. I don't know if I should put this as an explosion, cause nothing really exploded, it just kinda spit out the cloudy tear gas, so. I'll say this doesn't count, fight me. Bond and Grant tussle around in what I would say is a decent fight scene, only it's a little claustrophobic. But if Battle of the Bastards taught us anything, it's that fights aren't always spectacular and often have a claustrophobic feel to them, so points for realism? Grant goes for a signature killing move with the watch wire, and although almost beaten, James is able to use a knife hidden in his briefcase to stab Grant in the arm and reverse that wire choke, killing Grant with it instead. Waking a drugged Romanova up, James plans to use Grant's escape to get the hell out of there, cause there's like three dead bodies on this train now. A truck blocking the tracks makes the train stop, and James and Tatiana jump off. Heading to the truck, the driver starts calling for Grant like he's a dog that just ran away or something. Grant, where are you? Grant! Here, boy. Where are you, Grant? Come here. But he finds another dog. A dog named Bond. James knocks him out and ties him up, laying Romanova on the flowers in the back to sleep off that gnarly hangover. Driving to a boat Grant had waiting, James is chased by a helicopter. That's fancy. The helicopter operated by two Spectre agents, as Grant's death was no doubt discovered soon after they fled the train. The Spectre agents start throwing grenades, hoping to straddle the truck, adding three more explosions to our list. Seeming to work, James stops the truck and jumps out, preferring to run on foot, bringing that handy briefcase rifle with him. Is he really gonna be able to? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, they're both dead, yep. That gives us two more deaths to add, and of course, one more big explosion as the helicopter lights up in the background. Finally getting to Grant's getaway boat, Romanova and James hop in, pushing Mr. Truck Driver Guy off the side. Pretty sure he's just gonna drown in that water, James, but hey, I didn't see it, so I guess you're off the hook for this one. 
And just like that, Tatiana and James are off to Venice. I hope they double check the mirrors in their hotel this time. Back at number one's office, Kronstein and Kleber are all sweaty and nervous because their plan was a disastrous failure. Bond's still alive and they don't have a lector at all, so number one's gotta hand out some punishment. Morzeni comes in and kicks Kronstein in the leg with a boot knife. Ah, that's probably like a week of recovery. Oh no, never mind, he's dead. The knife was coated in a fast acting venom, killing Kronstein. Number one tells number three that he doesn't want any more delays. You know how it is, Kleb. Do it or die. Back on the the boat, Morzeni and some Spectre agents jump onto a few more boats and start chasing Romanova and Bond on the water, giving us our second chase of the movie. Morzeni instructs his men to start giving some warning shots, and they're using a mortar? Damn, careful with that thing, man. I'll count each mortar explosion as its own, because they're all separate, and that fits the bill for what I consider an explosion anyway, and that gives us eight more explosions to add. That's a lot of action. But we're not done yet. The Spectre agents shoot through the gas drums on the back of Bond's boat, and he releases them into the water. Appearing to finally give up, Romanova quickly hands James a flare gun, and he shoots the water with it, giving us our throw the rest of the budget at it moment and another explosion to add to the list. We get another explosion that'll count soon after as two Spectre boats collide, and another one as Morzeni jumps off of his boat as it explodes. I don't see any confirmed deaths here, but I will count Morzeni as he's the only guy I see on fire, and he never returns to the series, so he's probably dead. I mean, yeah, probably. Finally making it to Venice, James and Romanova are all safe and cozy in their fancy Italian hotel. Except Rosa fucking Kleb tracks them down and pretends she's just a maid. Romanova, however, recognizes her immediately, and Kleb pulls a gun on James. Kleb don't know that Romanova fucking loves James now, and she lets down her guard as Tatiana comes in clutch with a disarming. This scene is pretty funny as Kleb tries her darndest to hit James with that boot knife, but she's just too small and James pins her up against a wall with a chair. Romanova picks up Kleb's gun and puts number three down. Now truly free from Spectre's plot for the time being, James and Romanova cozy up on a boat in the Venice Canal, where James gets busy tossing that porno tape into the water. And that ends the second James Bond movie, so how action-packed was From Russia With Love? We got 31 kills, 17 explosions, and two chase scenes in From Russia With Love, giving us a total of 50 action events over a 115 minute runtime. This means it's now our number one spot in kills and explosions, but only makes it tied for first with chases. Will the numbers just keep going up with the budgets on these films? Next week we cover Goldfinger and find out. Thanks for watching Action Packed, I hope you enjoyed the episode. Be sure to leave movie suggestions in the comments. If it's got explosions and guns, you know I'll be watching that shit, man. We're just starting out, so help me figure out how I can make these things better. I know my narration probably needs a little work, I'm sorry about that. I love making videos, I really just want to make good content, so uh, yeah, stay safe. Safe, everybody.